along uh, the Brotherton Road here, and in fact, um, you can't quite see all of them, um, but there's a reason why the Hazen tablet is at an angle to the uh, Brotherton Road like this, and in fact, um, uh, just on down um, in the shadows, they're not standing out real well. But there's two, uh, two more tablets down there, uh, to Palmer's Division and Crufts Brigade. They sit at a similar angle to this road, and beyond that is the one for Gross's Brigade, and it too is at um, this kind of this angle to the, uh, to the road. That um, they are they are angled or stair stepped like this to emulate that um, in echelon movement of uh, Palmer's division out here into, um, into this action. Um, and when uh, Palmer, for, uh, when Hazen's brigade first went in um, here, um, he will go in in the standard Casey's tactics formation initially of two regiments up and two regiments back. Um, subsequently, there'll be uh, redeployments within the brigade, but initially it's two up, two back. Um, there is a gap of more than another brigade's front, probably almost, what, two brigades' front, between Hazen's left and the closest next troops off to his left, which is the right of Billick's brigade of Richard Johnson's um, division. Um, well, well initially, initially, first, yeah, yeah. initially um, Dodge is still well in the um, in the rear, um, so there's actually a big space um, between Hazen's left and um, and we, uh, we lost right. a good portion of it. It's kind of Willick's brigade is kind of up there where we are. Right. So we've kind of come across that um, uh, that space, um, and the. Um, uh, uh, Hazen's, um, well, really all of uh, Palmer's um, engagement is going to be very heated uh, because he has, along with Johnson, bumped into um, the biggest um, Confederate division at this time on the battlefield, um, that of uh, Benjamin Franklin Cheatham, um, who's got three brigades deployed across his front, um, Jackson's brigade, uh, Smith's Brigade and Wright's Brigade off in, um, in this direction. Um, and Hazen um, will be, uh, be heavily engaged um, in, um, in the fight, um, and they will, um, will push eastward um, on out into the field. We'll probably see this a little bit better um, later on. But the monuments you see out there in the field are going to be for, uh, for Hazen's forward um, position. But as they push um, eastward, uh, that is what's going to, um, to start to bring um, the, the first of, um, of church and people into the fight. So, yes, sir. And they stood on the crest in the open field firing down. They weren't here at the edge of the world. Well, um, when, you, when, you read, when you read the reports, is it, it's as if they move into one place and stay there. But when you read the tablets, and the information on the tablets is provided by veterans. <laughs> veterans. <laughs> when you read other primary source yep, and, and other primary source accounts, they engage back here and fight their way forward to that rise in the field, which actually makes more sense, um, not just on its face, but also um, with the Confederate account. The Confederates. Um, uh, Preston Smith, in particular here at Brock Field, Preston Smith has advanced a fair distance eastward and then is stopped and then falls back. There's a lengthy account from a guy in the 41st Ohio, um, I think his name is Kimberly, who basically says that they get here, they engage, they see the Confederates advancing, and then they both rush for a, a strip of timber, of, of a fringe of trees, and it could just be those dead standing trees. Even. In the middle of the field, the uh, Hazen's people get there first, and that's what drives the Confederates back. So, yeah, from from the reports, it's very static, and from Hazen's report especially, it sounds like they come up, they plant, 400 guys die, and then they retreat, or, or then they're replaced. But it's it's a rolling action forward. Yeah. Um, and they're going to uh, going to push um, push forward. Um, uh, Smith's um, uh, people 
the, um, uh, the 12th and 47th um, Tennessee, they have pushed out into the field some distance. Um, they actually first fall back to um, the wet weather drainage um, that we talked about earlier that's in the uh, eastern portion of, um, of Rock Field and think they're going to fight there, but they were then ordered very specifically by the staff of the brigade to fall back to the low fence um, on the, uh, the eastern edge of, um, of the field, and that's where they'll spend most of their, um, their time then fighting. Uh, the, um, and, and that also will allow Hazen then to push um, out into the field. And th this is all also taking um, a, a lot longer than many of the written accounts uh, would make it um, uh, sound like. This is, is several hours um, in length. Even Preston Smith's engagement is probably about two hours long, even though none of his accounts make it seem like it's... Um, but yeah, he's out there for a time, then he's got orders to maneuver, he sends back telling uh, Cheatham that he's short of ammunition, he'd, he'd like to be replaced, but that doesn't happen right away. Yeah, there's a, a lengthy engagement, and Hazen is here, what do they say? This is 1230 two, here. Yeah, they yeah. claim that Hazen's replaced about 2 o'clock? Uh, well, we'll there see, there it was relieved about 4 o'clock by Hazen's brigade. So. Which is probably too late. It's probably more like 3 o'clock. Because Hazen, after this, Hazen will end up going back to Pofield to get resupplied uh, himself, and then he'll be involved in other stuff later. So. Uh, but, uh, again, now we're at, um, at this edge of the field, looking out towards where Hazen's going to, uh, to go. Uh, remember, What's there an awful lot of up there? Down, fell in, fallen trees or felled timber. Um, and, um, um, and that's part of, um, of the action too. So Hazen now is fighting off um, to that direction um, and to give Hazen some support um, and to eventually begin the replacement of Hazen, um, Joseph Reynolds uh, responding for, uh, from, um, or responding to requests for assistance, um, Joseph Reynolds will ride up to the uh, 92nd Ohio and 18th Kentucky, marching up the Lafayette Road towards uh, McDonald's, and is going to, uh, to turn them uh, eastward into the, um, into the woods. So. Reynolds is going to have an interesting effect here. He's had a conversation with George Thomas uh, at right about 11.30 or so where Thomas uh, basically tells him to hold back in Brotherton Field and to give help where he can. Uh, and so he will spend the rest of the day uh, from noon on basically trying to orchestrate some uh, federal uh, responses uh, from the vicinity of Brotherton Field. He rides north and this is how uh, the, he, he pulls away half of Turchin's brigade. Uh, later he will assemble artillery uh, he will uh, retain King's Brigade, not John King that we saw, but uh, Edward King, who's, uh, who's the other brigade of his division and committed elsewhere. But, but he's going to come up two or three times in this process, uh, and, and that's his effect on Turchin at this battle. Okay, we're going to go just a little bit further to the west and then loop up and join the first part of Turchin. We um, uh, are also in um, a, a part of what gives even a little more sense of openness to this part of the fighting is that right here, just on the western edge of the Brock Field, there was another one of the unique ecological communities on this battlefield known as a cedar glade. And we're in the middle of this cedar glade um, right now. Um, the geology here is layer upon layer of limestone, and in some places that limestone is close enough to the surface that it is exposed, um, and rainwater following on that limestone would dissolve some of it. Um, animals moving across it, fire burning across it would cause that limestone to break down um, and spread around. That's going to create a more or reduce the pH in the soil, make it more basic and some plants uh, will not grow in really basic soil. Other plants really like basic soil, um, and uh, cedars are one of them, um, and um, 
uh, the, uh, and so you get these kind of grassy open areas, and as you look back across this one, um, you, uh, you see one uh, with some cedars in them and ringing them. These are essentially the same as the cedar glades or cedar breaks on the Stones River battlefield. The cedar breaks just being a place where the cedars are really, really, really dense um, as opposed to kind of an open area. Many of the soldiers called the cedar glades here old fields. They looked like an area that had been cleared for cultivation and then abandoned. And I'm sure some of the people walking out into them said, yeah, I know why that farmer um, abandoned it. In fact, I don't even know why he wasted his time clearing it with all these rocks right here. Well, not, not anything the farmer did. It's a natural phenomenon. Uh, most of the cedar glades on the battlefield today have been squeezed down over the years because of the advent of exotic invasives like Chinese privet um, and the removal of disturbance such as livestock and fire. Um, this one still actually retains a little bit of size. Um, and so make this a lot bigger and you'll, it'll be more like um, uh, many of the other cedar glades on the battlefield. But beginning not far off in that direction is the zone of those felled trees. Now, when Reynolds um, ordered um, uh, Colonel um, Benjamin Fearing, the commander of the 92nd Ohio, um, and the trailing um, 18th Kentucky um, to turn eastward, they, um, uh, the, the 92nd Ohio deployed in the line of battle um, and advanced um, eastward into the woods. The trailing 18th um, Kentucky um, uh, was in column of division. Um, he, uh, it's companies in two company pairs, one behind the other, um, and they advance out here. Um, and the, um, uh, the 92nd Ohio is first going to become engaged on the left of, um, of Hazen's Brigade. Um, and, um, uh, and as, uh, let's see, there are two of these tablets. We'll see the other one in just a second. Is this the one that said, yeah, here it is. Um, the, um, uh, and came into action on this round with Hazen's Brigade of Palmer's Division to the right and front um, and Billick's Brigade of Johnson's Division to the left. Um, and so they're actually initially kind of going in to, uh, to fill this gap between Hazen out there in, um, in Brock Field and Billick off to the, um, uh, to the north. Um, they, the 92nd is engaged for um, a, um, a short time since there is still a space off to their, um, uh, to their left. The 18th, um, Ohio, or 18th Kentucky is then deployed forward in the line the, uh, the column of divisions, those pairs of companies, are moved forward in echelon and regimental line of battle is formed. And then the 18th Kentucky moves to the, uh, to the left front and up onto the left of the 18th Ohio and becomes engaged. And they also, even though they don't necessarily say it, they also seem to be advancing as they are doing this. So, because um, they, they seem to wind up further to the east and um, then they start out, although none of them, none of the accounts I've seen from them really talk much about any advance. So. I think it's a fairly gradual thing. Yeah. Partly it's because the Confederates are, are, are disappearing, inching back. Yeah. And so they just, just kind of move forward. It's not necessarily a real forward movement. They just are trying to stay engaged. The enemy's pulling back a little bit. They move forward. Uh, uh, Plus, uh, we, we haven't really got there yet, but at one point, uh, I mentioned Dodge's Brigade earlier. Dodge's Brigade will launch an attack that will relieve the pressure along all of this front from Hazen, Willick, uh, and, and this half of Turchin, and then there will be some federal line readjustments. Um, uh, probably reflecting um, uh, Turchin's um, position in, amongst uh, veterans in the post-war period, uh, but also uh, seemingly uh, Philander Lane, um, Turchin's brigade gets a little more commemoration on the battlefield than, uh, than some other brigades um, uh, do. Uh, you see this tap, this is uh, Turchin's brigade, first position. So, uh, anything else you want to add right here? Okay. Um, questions or observations? All right. Well, let's kind of um, inch forward as the Confederates start to pull back and we drive them back.
reflecting on the, that interest in Turchin's Brigade that I mentioned a, a moment ago, um, but um, uh, and also um, the um, uh, the split nature of the brigade. Here, just a few yards away, is another tablet, most specifically for the uh, the 92nd and the um, uh, the 18th. Um, the um, uh, they will um, uh, will be engaged um, here for um, uh, for a time um, and um, uh, e edging forward as um, as we identified um, and um, and soon they are um, are joined by the rest of Turchin's brigade. Um, Turchin in an angry. Yeah. And an angry uh, General Turchin, because his brigade um, has been uh, been split up um, on him. Um, and um, the 11th and 36th Ohio um, will come up behind the um, uh, the uh, 92nd and the 18th. Um, the 11th uh, on the right uh, and the 36th on the uh, the left. Um, and both. Um, the um, 11th behind the 92nd Ohio, they will there be, or they will be there for a short time. Accompanying them is the brigade's battery, the 21st Indiana Battery, whose tablet I pointed down the trail to, and who, well, the sun's not causing it to stand out um, right now. Certainly not far from. Yeah, but it's just a short distance um, over there, um, and they're not going to be able to fire a great deal. Uh, but they do fire some rounds um, early on. Later on, they'll fire a little bit more, but initially um, they're, uh, they're not really able to, um, to engage. Um, and it is really after the arrival of um, the 11th and the 36th that, the, um, that Turchin begins to replace Hazen, as has been mentioned on the Hazen tablet, as Dave and I have mentioned, as has been mentioned on these um, these tablets. Yeah, there, there's one minor tweak to that. Hazen, um, for a while out there when Hazen was unsupported, he was fighting with three regiments forward and one regiment in reserve. And when the 18th and 92nd show up, he uses that opportunity to shorten his own line and go back to a two and two formation. His people have taken quite a bit of punishment out there. I mentioned 400 casualties earlier. That represents their loss on September 19th. It's not all happening uh, at this at this spot. Some of it happened out in, in Brotherton Field, but um, he's lost some. He's lost the commander of 124th Ohio. The 6th Kentucky has taken severe officer casualties and will take a lot more. So he's using that opportunity to shorten his own line and bring these guys in. So he's partially replaced. And then when the other two regiments show up, by then. Hazen's been in action almost three hours, and all of his troops are running very low on ammunition, if not out. Yeah, and, and in fact, Hazen, um, Hazen will claim that um, that all of his men fired 100 rounds per man. One of the regiments even says it's 120 rounds. Right. I don't remember which one that is. Um, um, Hazen, in his report, says that um, he had had one um, uh, ammunition wagon accompany his brigade into the woods from the Lafayette Road, and that they had used up all the ammunition on that wagon. In his memoir, Narrative of Military Service, he, uh, his Chickamauga, particularly the September 19 Chickamauga stuff, is mostly his own insertion of his own report, which is actually not all that helpful for <laughs> September 19. Um, but then after the report, he, um, he adds a little bit of commentary, um, and in that commentary, he says it had been two wagons of ammunition that he had brought um, east of the, uh, the road. So the truth is somewhere in between. So. Can, can, can we orient? They're, they're engaging Cheatham's division. Yes. Preston Smith? Uh, Pres uh, um, uh, Hazen um, and Turchin primarily engaging, engaging Preston Smith. A little bit of uh, the um, left of Jackson's brigade um, up here, um, but, um, but mostly 
um, Preston Smith. And Cheatham went went forward three and two, didn't right. he? Yes. Okay. Um, as we faced them, Jackson would be off to the um, uh, to the left front. He is mostly going up against um, uh, against Billick, um, and um, and then later Dodge. Um, the um, and then. Uh, in the center was Preston Smith's brigade, and then Marcus right. Wright's brigade on the um, on the left. And there seemingly, at least between Preston Smith's left and Wright's uh, right, there seems to have been a pretty big space. Wright seems to be pretty far off, um, right. yeah, because the, the the left regiment in Preston Smith, um, 11th, is it? Um, uh, well, they, his report is really short to begin with, but you don't get the sense that he that there was really anything on his left. So. They're, uh, yeah, they're getting attenuated more and more the further south you go on the Confederate side. Yeah, I think when Marcus Wright um, uh, crossed the, um, uh, the the cornfield, he winds up veering more to the um, to the west. Probably saw that far western edge of the field and move towards it more directly, and that opens space between Preston Smith and... I, I haven't, I mean, uh, Wright doesn't say this, but I have the sense in, in, in reading the, the reports that what he saw was a heavier engagement to his right, to his north, and so he starts to look for that flank, uh, and he doesn't realize the, the echelon depth of the Union uh, flank in that area down in there. So he ends up fighting two Union brigades, uh, pieces of Cruft and all of Gross. Mm -hmm. So uh, the other thing we should note is that uh, because this is a spot where, uh, because we have two federal divisions plus uh, Turgeon's brigade, we have uh, essentially seven Union brigades involved here. Um, this this dramatically illustrates the difference between uh, a brigade fighting with Casey's and a brigade fighting with. Uh, uh, Scott's, Scott. because all of the Confederates are stretched out in a single line. Jackson's brigade uh, of, uh, is going to engage uh, eight regiments, basically, though only four at a time, because he's going to have to fight both Willick's brigade and Dodge's brigade of Johnson's division. Smith is going to engage uh, these, these two regiments of Turchin, uh, he's going to have to fight Hazen, and Hazen actually goes into that three, uh, three and one deployment, and then he's going to fight um, the left half of Cruft's brigade. So each Confederate brigade is coming into uh, a Union line that, for once, is backed up with a reserve support line. They have plenty of opportunity to exchange. Uh, you know, when a unit runs low on ammo, they can. They can swap the units out. That's what Hazen's doing. That's what Turchin will do. Uh, so it's a it's a nice illustration of the differences in the Army tactical. Doctrine. Well, well, does Cheatham does Cheatham move May and Straw? Um, as as Preston Smith um, uh, builds his case with Cheatham that he is running short on ammunition, um, which. Um, uh, you, know, you uh, the part of the reason why I say it that way is that when you look at um, um, the uh, Preston Smith's ordnance officer's return and you do the division of the approximate number of men in each one of the regiments based on the number of ammunition or number of rounds of ammunition that's reported to have been fired um, uh, have they really fired all the rounds in their cartridge box um, but um, as, as Smith impresses upon Cheatham that his men are running short on ammunition, um, uh, Cheatham will authorize his replacement with Strahl's brigade. And, um, and, and Jackson doesn't and, really have the luxury. I mean, Jackson's brigade essentially uh, gets thrown into disorder by uh, Villick's attack and Dodge's, Dodge's. attack. So that uh, when Maney comes up, it, he... He doesn't find Jackson at all, according to his reports. Yeah. And, uh, he's he's not replacing anyone. He's filling a hole. Okay. How many rounds would have got here? Well, the, the, normal... the, cart the normal cartridge box is supposed to have 40 rounds in it. Um, the um, and, and in the Union Army here, um, the pretty standard. The men have been issued another 20 rounds to carry somewhere on their person. Um, now, there's a problem with doing that, 
because the ammunition came in packs of 10 and that paper wrapping that those 10 rounds in is not a lot of protection to the paper tube containing the um, powder and the bullet. So a lot of perspiration could soak through that paper. Um, uh, if you don't, uh, if you put it in your front pocket and it's just pressing up, you're going to break that um, that paper up. So uh, the um, uh, problem with issuing the cavalry too many paper rounds is that they, it, during the jolting of the horse, they tend to shake loose, and, and you could have a whole bunch of empty paper tubes. How, how many rounds would they put on a wagon? Well, it's, it's based on the capacity of the wagon, um, and because uh, a box of a thousand rounds of 58 or 577 caliber ammunition, the standard ammunition, um, and it was normally packed in a thousand rounds to a wooden box for shipping, that box weighed 98 pounds. Um, and so think 100 pounds. Um, a U.S. Army six-mule baggage wagon um, uh, on the, the good roads out here could have had 2,500, even 3,000 pounds. But in the mountainous terrain here, they had reduced most of the wagons to, um, to 2,000 or 1,500 pounds uh, load. So only 15 to 20 boxes. And if we have the time, I'll take you over to the maintenance area and roll our reproduction of six-mule U.S. Army baggage wagon out get our empty, um, mocked up a uh, ammunition boxes. I even have one that I've weighted out to be 98 pounds. Um, and I normally use that with Marines. Um, the, um, um, uh, but we can put them in um, uh, 15 or 20 boxes will not even cover the floor of the wagon one time. Right. Um, and uh, so if now the Confederate Army has got uh, very few six uh, animal wagons. They mostly have four animal wagons, which can carry a lot less, um, only about two-thirds of what a six-mule wagon could, uh, can carry. Confederate Army has a fair number of two animal wagons, which can carry a lot less. Um, so it, it depends on the capacity of the, um, of the vehicles. Then I'll get Sam's. Quick, two quick questions. Um, these units that are in action here, do we know what kind of weapons they're, they have? I know that they all have uh, 58 caliber uh, of some sort. Yeah. The, okay. the predominant weapon is a Springfield uh, or or equivalent thereof. And 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 to follow up on that, if you're firing off 100 rounds, how many rounds are you going to fire that the gun becomes fouled? I mean, can you fire off 100 rounds and it's not completely uh, messed up? Well, are you having to clean it in to, between? You're going to have to do something to um, to get some of the fouling out of the bore. Uh, now this is the time period when the Williams cleaner bullet is um, being used. There's one Williams cleaner in each pack, so you know, despite all the complaints about those things, they did actually work a little bit. Um, and um, uh, but you know, you're going to have to you're going to have to take the ramrod and um, and just run it down the barrel and agitate the barrel. Uh, maybe sacrifice a little bit of the water in your uh, canteen. I haven't haven't seen um, any account from uh, from Chickamauga of guys um, peeing in the uh, in the barrels. Um, but uh, there are a lot the of those thing. from the Atlanta campaign. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and those those barrels are hot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really <laughs> thrilled about that. <laughs> but, um, really good hands. Yeah. yeah. But you um, you know they, they they're they'd have to um, they'd have to do something to try to get some of that fouling out and that's a factor the rate of fire will slow the longer you're in action that's another reason why Casey's is favored especially in Rosecrans army but why why Casey went to this two up two back formation because while those guys are back replenishing their cartridge boxes they are also getting a chance to do something about their rifles another problem is um, uh, if, if the cap doesn't detonate right, you, you've got a problem, a clogged nipple on, on your musket. Foul the, the, on it. the sergeant can come around. He's got various tools to change a nipple or clean it or whatever. All of that can be taken care of while the fresh regiment steps up and maintains the pressure when on the fight. When did they go to that? What? When did they go to that? Uh, Casey's tactics is um, uh, uh, once the war began, uh, well, even before the war began, the Army recognized that, um, that Hardy's tactics, um, that, that it was an improvement, but there were still some issues with it. Um, and all Hardy had uh, done was write alternate volumes for, uh, uh, for volume one and two of the three-volume tactical set. 
Um, and so once the war began, very quickly the Union Army realized that, oh, we got to get this all into sync. So a new US Ar a new commission of U.S. Army officers was put together under Silas Casey, hence Casey's tactics. Um, and he, or he and this commission went through um, and, um, and, and selected all the good things, refined the system, and um, uh, published in the summer of 1862 a three-volume um, uh, new tactical system. Um, in August of 1862, the War Department in Washington said the tactics of this army are Casey's tactics. Um, and um, but it would uh, take considerably longer for people to start using it. Start using it, right. Nobody uh, was using it before. They could feel that but, but, well, well Don, Don Carlos Buell um, starts to, um, uh, to use it before he is uh, replaced. Um, Rosecrans um, really commits to it. And you can see most of Rosecrans' brigades at Stones River um, using the new Casey's tactics. By this time, the Army of the Cumberland is exclusively fully using Casey's tactics. And Dave can tell you that the Army of the Potomac, um, even to the very end of the war, has not fully adopted. If you, one of the things that, that I noticed uh, in my own mapping and then looking at other maps, and, and so I started to consistently look at maps of of how the Army of the Potomac, the Army of the Tennessee was under Sherman and Grant, and the Army of the Cumberland engaged. And the only outfit that I found that fully utilized Casey's was Rosecrans. Um, the Army of the Potomac used it the least, uh, and you don't see it in use ev much even in, uh, um, the, Army of the, East in East the wilderness East. in 1864, oh, yeah. for instance. Uh, uh, Hancock's uh, attack uh, um, is all Brigades in single lines, one behind the other, uh, instead of paired two, two up, one back. Uh, the Army of Tennessee seems to use it a little bit. Actually, if you look at Tim Stim Smith's Champion Hill book, his maps will show some brigades using what looks like Casey's and other brigades in a, in a straight hard ease line. And, so, but even to the very end of the war, down at, um, at Fort McPherson, um, there are, um, there are not, uh, Fort McAllister, there at, um, uh, at Savannah, there are some Army of the Tennessee troops who are still not Soldiers using. are lazy, <laughs> and unless you force them to learn new things, they won't, and they'll just use what they've learned in the first place. Uh, that's, I, I suppose that's human nature, right? But, um, but the only man, the only army, rather, because it's Buell too, but, but really it's Rosecrans, it's Rosecrans' influence. Thomas must have recognized the value of it because that's one of the things that Thomas does not back off of. He, he backs off some of the things that Rosecrans was advocating when he gets command of the army in October 1863. But Casey's is not one of them. He must, he must like it. The CSA never stole the manual. <laughs> well, believe, believe it or not, there is a Confederate imprint edition of Casey's tactics. They got hold of a set and a southern publisher published a confederate edition but the confederate war department never adopted it why who's one of the big heroes of the united states military in the antebellum period winfield, winfield scott, winfield scott. Winfield scott. Yeah. Yeah. and who wrote um, the revision to the um, inf uh, infantry tactics in the 1850s william joseph hardy and Hardy used his influence to get the War Department to officially adopt it for the soldier, company, and battalion level. Um, and um, uh, the, um, the official publisher of, um, of Hardy's tactics for the Confederate Army is um, Goetzel um, in Mobile, Alabama. And, um, and Hardy, in the spring of 1864, spends um, a lot of time over in his camp at Dalton uh, writing letters to his attorneys in Mobile <laughs> saying, sue this person, sue this person, sue this They're person, using, sue this person my for copyright <laughs> infringement. Uh, um, so. And I got to say, as a, as a recent author, I sympathize with the man. <laughs> <laughs> but wait a minute. He did that on government service, uh, government duty. Shh, don't tell anybody. Yeah. Um, so, uh, he's getting paid in Confederate money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Sam, you had a question? Uh, well, just an observation, uh, but that's not to say the Confederates didn't use a uh, two up, two back. There, 
right, at various times. Right, and, and in Scott's tactics, um, it identifies the option of two mm -hmm. up, two back, um, alternate formations. But it, the default in Scott is um, all regiments online and yeah, all it's brigades interesting. online. Both Scott and Hart and um, uh, Casey give the brigade commander the option right. form as needed. Yeah. But Scott's illustrations have all the battalions in a single line, <laughs> and Casey's illustrations have all the battalions <laughs> two up, two, two up, back. two back. So guess what everybody did? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, did they read the books or did they look at the pictures? <laughs> <laughs> pictures are worth a thousand words. So. Somebody, um, yeah. well, comment your question. Um, comment. You, yes, at Perryville, you see more three up and one back. And you can see Jules Army starting to transition into Casey's, uh, particularly in the Russo's division. They were definitely doing that. Question, which is sidebar, 11th and 36th, these are Antietam boys, how do they get out here? And I should know this answer. They, they, they actually go um, go back to Western Virginia. They were part of, of the old uh, Kanawha um, Army. They actually go back to Western Virginia, um, where they will be joined by the uh, the 92nd. Um, and, um, and then... Um, as a result of, um, uh, of the Kentucky campaign, uh, or kind of the aftermath of the Kentucky campaign, they just get, be, they're, they're pushed further and further um, west. It's, it's worth and noting that the man who commanded this brigade before Turchin is George Crook. George, yeah. And in uh, Crook, uh, this brigade gets, uh, ends up getting sent west, and then Crook and Turchin switch places. Turchin was a cavalry general whom David Sloan Stanley hated. Uh, and uh, 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 Crook was uh, was someone that Stanley wanted, so they end up switching places. Now that's going to change. I don't remember where the 11th goes, but the 36th will go back in 1864, back into Virginia, back into the valley. Yeah, I think they both do. I know, I know the 36th is at Cedar Creek, and I think the yes. 11th might be. The, um, the um, uh, I forget what the the thing was that, that goes on in Kentucky that gets them pushed into Kentucky, and then, then they get drawn down into Tennessee. They spend much of the um, early part of 1863 at um, Hartz, uh, Hartzell, or Hartsville, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. um, and Probably Marshall's Army or something. Yeah, there was something, there was something that happened in, um, in Kentucky, um, but, um, but then, they are, then they're drawn in um, to the Army of Cumberland. But it is interesting that the, the 11th and 36th are Here. Antietam, so and, and, mm -hmm. uh, Burnside Bridge. Guys, yeah. I, I may have this wrong, but was, wasn't it Turchin who used that kind of a going back to this tactic? But I thought he used a sort of a fire in advance. That's uh, that's Billy. Just Billy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, the um, in in Preston Smith's um, brigade, um, the um, uh, the um, uh, his right regiment to our left front. Uh, fires um, 10,338 rounds of ammunition. That's um, not very many rounds per man. Uh, the 12th and 47th um, Tennessee, 14,350. The 11th Tennessee, 4,320. And the 29th Tennessee, um, uh, 10,600 for a total of 39,608 um, rounds of ammunition. So, uh, Used or dropped. Yeah, yeah. used fire. or dropped, right. Well, mostly fire. Yeah. So, uh, who's got a calculator real quick? Divide. Um, let's see. We'll do it the other way. Say a 400 man regiment fires off uh, 100 rounds apiece. Yeah. That's, that's 40,000 rounds. Right there. Yep. So that gives you the, the sense of where we're at. Mm -hmm. 400 man. Yeah, that'd be 400,000. No, no. Four zero. No, 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 that's right. 40,000. Add the two zeros to it. Yeah. Zero. Yeah. 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 Yeah, forty thousand. <laughs> yeah. um, so anyway, they're um, yeah, they're not um, not firing, uh, and that this is for the entire engagement. Now they don't see a lot of action other than here. But okay, um, let's see. The um, uh, the eleventh is um, has come up behind the um, uh, the ninety second, um, and and Hazen um, needing um, uh, assistance will ask um, uh, Colonel Philander Lane. Um, to move his regiment up on to the, uh, to the front line. Um, and, um, and Lane, um, in good Army fashion, says, 
Uh, I don't work for you. You'll have to ask my boss. Um, Hazen um, says, okay. And they make arrangements for somebody to go talk to Turchin. Um, but um, uh, Hazen, um, having, um, having made his case, uh, saying it was desperate, and Lane kind of seeing and sensing that, um, says, okay, yeah, it's pretty desperate. Um, and Lane begins to move up onto the front line to the right of the 92nd Ohio um, on his own initiative um, just before a staff officer from Turchin rides up and says, yeah, that's okay. Uh, and so he goes, uh, goes up, um, and shortly after that, uh, the 92nd Ohio, um, running short on ammunition, um, will, um, will be replaced by the 36th um, Ohio. But in some of this, um, this also has resulted in them shifting more over to the right. Begins, begins more of that rightward movement and turn that, um, that can become a major part of uh, Churchill's role here at Brock Fields. So. I think okay. we should move. Alrighty, so we're we're gonna move forward now and replace uh, replace